Dear learners, welcome to NIAOS studio. I am Shubhra Sharma and today I would like to talk about the lesson personality theories. Before we uh, delve into different theories of personality and understand what perspectives and theories have been given, we need to understand the term personality. In our everyday day-to-day -day usage, we use this term to signify various things. Say for example, how a person is dressed, how he or she talks, walks, his posture, gait, at times his attitudes, his thoughts, viewpoints. This is not very in sync with how we at, in psychology view personality. If we are to understand personality in the, in the psychological terms, it is something that is a characteristic pattern of thinking, feeling and behaving. These characteristic patterns have to be enduring, which endure over periods of time. They have to be distinctive and they have to be consistent, which means that any pattern of behavior or thinking which changes due to say extreme stress or due to some other reasons may not be very correctly classified under the term personality. Having understood this, let's move on to personality theories. There are different perspectives uh, uh, through which personality has been theorized. Some of those perspectives that we will today look at will be psychoanalytic, the trait perspective, the humanistic perspective, then the social cognitive perspective which has been given by Bandura and also once we have looked at these perspectives, we will also delve into the Indian perspective of personality. Before we start talking about all of these perspectives, we need to understand one thing. We will be very briefly touching all of these perspectives and not understanding them in depth. Hence, before you start using the terms that you today learn, you need to be very careful. Some of these terms you might be very motivated or interested in using or classifying people's behaviors as saying that, see, look, this is how he's behaving. This is what probably Freud has said or Bandura has said, and this is what it seems to be. Before you do that, before you start labeling or using these terms in your everyday life, you would need to understand these in much more depth, greater detail. And before you can look at others and point fingers at others, you might want to reflect back on yourself and your life and see how they apply to only yourself and not make assumptions of others. Having said that, let's look at some of the perspectives of personality theories, starting with psychoanalysis. Now, psychoanalytic perspective was founded by Sigmund Freud. This is a name that you may have come across very often. Since Sigmund Freud is somebody who is celebrated as the father of psychology. The reason for this being that he was the first person who brought out a comprehensive theory of personality. Before Freud, there were assumptions made as to how behavior or thought or learning or motivation takes place. However, there was no comprehensive theory of personality which covered every aspect, which also talked about what led to maladaptive behaviors, which also talked about how these maladaptive behaviors or uh, mental disorders can be treated. But Freud, having been, having been the first psychologist or, uh, to do so, is hence considered uh, the father of psychology and ha is still studied as, the f as, the, as a very important aspect of personality theories. Along with Freud, there are a few new Freudians who came about uh, you can say after psychoanalysis or in deference to psychoanalysis. Some of those main new Freudians are Carl Jung, Karen Horney and Alfred Adler. We will also be touching on these new Freudians very briefly. Now to talk about psychoanalysis. Sigmund Freud gave the first important concept of levels of consciousness. He talked about unconscious, which was something that was never touched on before in detail. Along with that, he talked about sexual and aggressive instincts. 
how early childhood experiences play a very important role in defining and creating personality. Freud gave the method of free association. During that time, uh, hypnosis was used as a very common and popular method to understand and treat maladaptive behavior. However, Freud tended to move away from the trend of hypnosis and he found that hypnosis was not as effective as his method of free association. Let's understand these in detail. The levels of consciousness that Freud gave were consciousness, pre-conscious and unconscious. Along with that, there were some personality structures that he talked about, id, ego and superego. Then he also talked about stages of psychosexual development, which is the oral, anal, phallic, latency and genital stage. Freud uh, likened the consciousness to an iceberg. If you know what an iceberg is, you would understand that an iceberg is a large mass, mass of ice which is only seen as a tip above the water and everything, 90 or 80 percent of that mass of ice remains under the water. In a similar manner, what Freud said was that the tip of the iceberg is the consciousness. The conscious awareness that is accessible to us, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires that we are aware of. However, everything under the water is the pre-conscious or the unconscious. Now the pre-conscious mind or the pre-conscious level of uh, consciousness is are the thoughts, feelings, desires, uh, drives that we may not be conscious of in an everyday life, but we can bring these to consciousness with some effort. On the other hand, the unconscious are the thoughts, feelings, uh, desires, even sometimes memories that we are not aware of, which lie in the unconscious. And as per Freud, these could only be accessed through the method of free association or at times dream interpretation. Now having understood these levels of consciousness, let's move on to the structure of personality. Freud gave the concepts of it, ego and superego. It is the pleasure principle. All our biological drives that we have of hunger, thirst and sex are represented through id. Id is like a child who wants gratification, uh, wants it at the time that it wants it and will not rest until the object that will gratify its needs is met. Slowly as a, a person grows, Freud said that an ego is developed. Ego functions through the reality principle. It understands, takes into account the demands of id, but also understands the reality of the external world and tries to meet the needs of id through correct means, by socially appropriate uh, objects at the right time in the right manner. So it tries to create a balance between the external reality and the demands that it places on the individual. Now, as an individual grows further and is met by rewards and punishments uh, by his or her parents or through the social world, uh, Freud conceptualized that at, through these rewards and punishments, a super ego is developed. This is the moral seat of personality. It tries to uh, strive for the ideal. It uh, tries to make judgments of right and wrong. It tries to force ego into doing the morally or ideally right thing. And when such desires are not met, uh, a lot of guilt, shame, uh, sense of inferiority and even anxiety may be created. Now to recap, there are three structures of personality, id, ego and superego. Id is the pleasure principle, superego is the morality principle and ego is the reality principle which tries to strike a balance between the demands of id 
the demands of the superego as well as the demands of the external world. Moving on, uh, Freud gave uh, the stages of personality development. They are known as the psychosexual stages of personality development because as per Freud, sexuality and sexual and aggressive instincts played a very important role in the development of personality. Uh, the psychosexual stages of development are the oral stage where as per Freud, the main uh, pleasure center is the mouth or the oral area and uh, the, a child derives pleasure through sucking and biting. The next stage is the anal stage where the main pleasurable area is the anal area and bowel and bladder elimination is uh, supposed to be pleasure giving. The third stage as per Freud is phallic stage where uh, a child uh, gains pleasure through stimulation of his genital area. Now uh, once a child grows, uh, he enters the latency stage. Here as per Freud, due to uh, social uh, understanding and rewards and punishments, a child un realizes that expression of so sexual needs and stimulation of genital areas is not socially acceptable. Hence he or she tries to repress the sexual impulses and engage in more socially acceptable behavior. And the last stage is the genital stage where an individual engages in mature sexual interests. Now, uh, along with this, Freud also gave the concept of defense mechanisms. Before we look at all the defense mechanisms, we need to understand why these defense mechanisms come into picture. If you remember when we talked about the structure of personality, we said that there are three structures, id, ego and superego. Now as per Freud, id places a lot of demand on ego for immediate gratification of its needs. At the same time, the superego places very high demands on ego to behave, to deny id its uh, gratifications and to behave in an ideal, socially acceptable, correct manner. Along with this, the ego also faces a very high challenge of trying to meet, balance these needs and to meet these needs through external reality. This crucial task creates a lot of anxiety and when ego is not able to achieve it, this anxiety, this state of anxiety becomes difficult to manage. In order to manage this state of anxiety, defense mechanisms develop. We all engage in def these defense mechanisms. As individuals, all of these defense mechanisms help us deal with everyday, day-to-day -day life. However, when these defense mechanisms become very extreme or maladaptive, they tend to create abnormal behaviors in us. Some of these defense mechanisms may also play a positive role. Say for example, uh, repression or denial may at times help us safeguard our own personality or our own conscious mind. One defense mechanism is only positive, which is sublimation. Let's look at these one by one. One of the defense mechanisms is denial. You would have come across certain people who find it difficult to accept that they indulge in certain kinds of behaviors or they have certain problems. Say for example, an alcoholic. When you go approach an alcoholic or when family members try to approach an alcoholic and tell him that he has a problem, he or she generally tends to say that he does not have a problem, he is not addicted to alcohol, he can give it up anytime he wishes and this is not a problem at all. This is denial. Uh, any individual who does not, is not ready to accept reality and distorts reality to suit his, his or her needs is known as denial. Second is displacement. This takes place very often in our everyday day-to-day -day life. A lot of times when we cannot express unfavorable desires towards a, a certain person, we tend to displace them towards somebody else. Say for example, you went to your college, your teacher shouted at you, you are filled with anger towards your teacher but you can't express it towards him or her because he is an authority figure. 
Hence, you tend to displace that anger towards somebody else or something else. You will go vandalize uh, the school property, you will throw stones or you may shout at your younger brother or sister. This is known as displacement, where you displace unfavorable desires to an another object where it is easy to displace those desires to. Next is projection. If we are to understand projection, you must understand that a lot of times we may think or feel that a certain person is trying to show some emotions to us when in fact in reality those are our own emotions. To explain this in through an example, sometimes we say that person she hates me or my teacher she hates me or uh, uh, my boss he does not like me at all, he always keeps uh, uh, preferring other individuals. Whereas in reality it is us who hate our teacher or our boss or who dislike a certain individual. So we are projecting our own unfavorable emotions to someone else. Next is rationalization. Rationalization takes place when we try to rationalize or explain through logic some of our behaviors. Say for example, we might say, oh I behaved like that uh, towards my friend because she was doing this. She was the one who was behaving in this way, she was being unreasonable and hence I had to do what I did. This may be rationalizing our behavior. Next is reaction formation. Reaction formation takes place when we have some unfavorable emotion towards somebody, but that emotion is something that we are not able to accept or it is not socially acceptable, hence we form or behave in a completely opposite manner. During our office or college years, there might be somebody that we might not have very positive feelings towards and we and feeling guilty that we don't like someone, we might start behaving to overcompensate those feelings. So doing nice things for that person, appreciating that person, saying good things where actually unconsciously we don't like that person at all. So doing something which is totally opposite to what we actually feel is known as reaction formation. Next is regression where we regress to our childhood days, to an earlier age where we felt safe, we did not feel threatened. This may happen when there is a lot of stress or we feel some sort of threat to, from the external environment and then we tend to go back to an age where we were very safe, secure. Say for example, uh, sometimes when ch elder children have a young a girl brother or a sister, they tend to also regress to an earlier age, start bed wetting or sucking their thumb because they feel threatened by their sibling. Regression takes place when we tend to go back to an earlier, safer age uh, in order to deal with the outside stress and anxiety. Repression on the other hand happens when we tend to repress or uh, to push into the unconscious some of our experiences or memories which are so stress creating or anxiety creating that we cannot bear to remember them. At times uh, this may happen when a person is physically or sexually abused or has been subjected to some other form of trauma and these memories, these traumatic memories are too much for the person to bear. Hence he or she may completely forget that entire time of traumatic experience and repress it into the unconscious. The next defense mechanism which I earlier mentioned is a positive defense mechanism is known as sublimation. This is a positive defense mechanism because as per Freud sublimation takes place when we tend to channelize our unfavorable, unacceptable wishes and desires such as sexual desires into something more productive. So somebody might indulge in creative poetry writing or painting in order to channelize their 
um, sexual needs or somebody might indulge in sports in order to channelize their aggressive needs, etc. Moving on, the psychoanalytic perspective uh, had certain uh, criticizers. Certain followers of this psychoanalytic perspective like Carl Jung or Alfred Adler tended to move away or diverge from the uh, true psychoanalytic uh, point of view because they felt that sexuality was not the only instinct at work. All motivations were not sexual. There were other things that played an important role, say for example society or uh, internal uh, uh, appraisals of certain situations, etc. These psychoanalysts who tended to then add on to the psychoanalytic perspective are known as neo-Freudians. Some of these that we will look at today will be Carl Jung, Karen Horney and Alfred Adler. Carl Jung did not accept that sexual and aggressive instincts played a central role in motivating the development of personality or motivating an individual to act. According to him, it was the general psychological energy which motivated human beings. He also gave the concept of collective unconsciousness. In order to understand the concept of collective unconsciousness, you need to understand that he was talking about some form of unconsciousness that lasted through time and that we were born with it. It's like the history of the entire planet, the entire human race the, and the community in which we are born in, into and probably even the gender that we are born into, the family that we are born into. So to explain this further, say for example, I am uh, an Indian woman. If I was to understand my own collective unconsciousness, I would say that I have an, a collective unconsciousness of one, the entire human race. So all history of humankind, the kind of uh, difficulties that human race has faced, the kind of um, atrocities they may have gone through or the kind of struggles that they may have gone through, etc. Along with that, I also have a collective unconsciousness of the Indian race, the Indian community that I am born into. Plus, I have the collective unconsciousness of a female, the female gender. So, I unconsciously understand all kinds of difficulties or struggles that a female may have been through or subjected to. Now, these collective unconsciousness play a role in forming or, or defining our personality through archetypes. As per Jung, archetypes were inherent in the collective unconsciousness and they tended to manifest when an individual interacted with the society. These were inherent mental images which were consistent throughout. Everybody had these inherent mental images and which had certain names that uh, Jung tended to give them. Say for example, the hero or the father or the child. We will not be delving into what each of these archetypes mean, but these, as per Jung, these tend to come about and form the way we behave, think, etc. Especially when we are interacting with the outside world. Another new Freudian whose uh, theory is very uh, important is Karen Horney. She talked about uh, the aspect of social relationships in the development of personality. Freud tended to ignore or neglect any role that society may play when a person's personality is developed. Her, uh, hence, Karen Horney came about this theory where uh, she said that social relationships play a very important role and all behavior is developed in the context of the social relationship that an individual engages in. Hence, she talked about the concept of basic anxiety. This is how she went about to explain neuroticism, saying that basic anxiety was the main basic uh, proponent that created neuroticism in individuals. To understand the concept of basic anxiety, uh, let's understand what she says. She says that uh, an individual has feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, isolation. 
uh, when they are children and these uh, feelings tend to grow and manifest even as adults and they occur when we are inter in interaction with the social structure. Moving on, uh, Alfred Adler uh, also gave certain uh, concepts which are important to understand, one of them being striving for superiority. He said that uh, the major motivating factor was the, uh, the need to strive for superiority, that an individual had certain inferiorities that were inherent in him and in order to overcome these feelings of in in inferiority, he or she had to strive for superiority to overcome these feelings of inferiority. Now the psychoanalytic perspective has met with a lot of criticism. The main uh, criticism that plays a very important role in our understanding of Freud's uh, theory of personality is that it has a lack of empirical support. The theory was not based on any evidence, it was thought through and uh, perceived by Freud. He played a very important role in psychology, however his theory has to date uh, failed to generate empirical statistical research support. And hence when we look at Freud, we will always be careful in understanding or applying these perspectives in, the, in our understanding of psychology of human beings. There are certain uh, other theories that have looked at personality like trait theory which, is, which are completely based on scientific and research evidences. Let us look at them. Now the trait perspective talks about traits. Traits are understood as relatively stable and enduring patterns of behavior. The first major psychologist who brought out the trait perspective was Raymond Cattell. He found through research evidences and through statistical methods that there are 16 main source traits and individuals could be divided into these 16 uh, as per these 16 traits and it would explain all the traits that existed. Hence uh, we use the 16 personality factor which is a test that is used to uh, test uh, an individual's personality which you will be learning in subsequent modules. Then uh, one major uh, proponent of the trait perspective was McRae and Costa. You can understand the uh, traits that they have uh, identified uh, through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, consciousness, extraversion, agreeableness and neuroticism. Another uh, theorist who talked about the trait perspective and who gave a theory of through understanding of traits was Ising. He gave three dimensions which was introversion or ext extraversion, neurotic or stable and psychoticism. Now the trait perspective met with a lot of criticism. Uh, some of the critical appraisals said that one that the trait perspective does not give us the causes that cause individual differences the causes for certain kinds of behaviors and a lot of dynamic processes that take place in an individual before he or she be, uh, starts to behave or act in a certain manner. Also they said that uh, the human behavior was not just based on traits, it was always an interaction between traits and the social situations which then be, be, uh, explained how individuals beha behaved or gave us a better understanding of what that behavior meant. Hence moving on, there was a, a, a theory given by Albert Bandura which is known as the social cognitive perspective. Bandura said that individuals do not behave in isolation, there is always a reciprocal determinism which means there is a reciprocal interaction between three factors. One is of course the behavioral factors, the second is the environmental factors which means the social structure, the social context in which an individual is behaving. Also along with this, an individual is capable of thinking, feeling, determining his behaviors, controlling them, regulating them, hence there is also a role that cognitive factors play. So all three of these factors interact with each other and uh, have an effect on each other. Bandura also gave the concept of self-efficacy where he talked about how an individual has an understanding of what all his capabilities are, what he or she cannot, can or cannot achieve etc. However, his theory was also criticized on the basis that it does not account for the role of unconscious.
Now moving on to the human perspective. Now the human perspective ha takes a very different take of personality. Where on one hand Freud talks about all unfavorable, unwanted sexual desires, how individuals always are trying to achieve what is unconscious and trying to look back into the past and solve those past difficulties or uh, traumas etc. Human perspective talks about the future. It says that an individual has a free will. There is this concept of self that it, there is a, a concept of self that is created through an active creative force and an individual tries to drive this self into self-awareness to achieve the human potential and he has a free will to do so. One of the important uh, 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 psychologists of the human perspective was Carl Rogers. Along with them, him, there was Maslow who talked about uh, the need hierarchy. As per him, there, are a hi there is a hierarchy of needs. The lowest in the rung are the physiological needs. These are the biological needs of hunger, thirst, sex, uh, etc. As per Maslow, this, these are the first basic needs. Only once these needs are met, that we move on to the second set of needs, which are the safety needs. And in, uh, any organism has the need to be safe, to be secure, to remain alive, to then hence propagate, etc. So the second in the rung are the safety needs. Now once our safety needs are met, then we move on to the uh, next rung, which is the need for belongingness. All of us have the need to be to belong somewhere, to be part of a group, a social structure, to belong to a community, uh, to, to then hence be rooted somewhere. Once these needs of belongingness are met, that is when we then move on to the next few needs which are self-esteem, self-actualization and self-transcendence. Self-esteem comes through achievement, we have this need to achieve, to enhance our self-esteem. We also have the need to actualize ourselves to transcend into somebody beyond what we are today. Before we move on to the next topic, we need to understand one basic aspect of Maslow's need hierarchy. As per Maslow, only once an earlier need is met, can we move on to the next need. So hence, if an individual does not have enough to eat or is not, does not have a safe place to stay in, he will not delve into needs of self-actualization or self-transcendence. Now let us come to the Indian perspective of personality. As per the Indian perspective, we all have three gun, the Sattva gun, the Rajas gun and the Tamas gun. And these three tend to uh, define our personality. All of us have these three guns in larger or lesser amount. Some people strive for a higher um, uh, sattva gun, some people tend to stay in the rajas or the tamas gun etc. And all of them play a role, they are required at different times, they are important to us because they create an entire whole. Sattva talks about duty, discipline, determinism, rajas is vigorous activity, gratification, materialism and tamas is rooted in anger, aggression, arrogance, laziness and at times mental imbalance and depression. Now that we have looked at all these different perspectives of personality, one important question is how do we assess or understand personality of an individual. It is done through various methods. One of the most uh, natural method is observation and interview, where you observe a behavior in a naturally occurring environment or you use interviews to understand uh, motives or, behind or thoughts behind an individual's behavior. Second is rating skills, which a psychologist or an expert tends to rate an individual on different aspects of his personality. Then there are paper pencil tests like I mentioned the 16 PF which are given to the individual and he tends to answer questions and tick or say yes or no etc. And then these are tabulated to understand personality aspects of that individual. The last is the projective techniques. 
like thematic apperception test or Rorschach ink blot test where ambiguous pictures or images are shown to the individual and people are asked certain qu questions. These are used to in order to try and delve into the unconsciousness to tap the unconscious desires and needs of that individual. The factors that influence personality. Now that we've looked at all these different perspectives, let's create a, a holistic understanding of what now we have come to understand are the factors that influence or create or shape an individual's personality. The very first factor which plays a very important role are the genetics or the heredity of an individual. Our genetic makeup tends to play a very important role and researchers have shown that genetics may determine so much so as even our likes and dislikes or our attitudes towards things. Uh, these studies that have been done by comparing twins which lived in, which were raised by adoptive parents in very different environments, but sought similarities among those twins have found that genetics hence plays a very important role. Then there are early experiences. The parenting styles of our parents, our friends, our teachers, the kind of community that we grow into, what, what what uh, resources we have access to, all of these determine our personality. The primary groups, the behaviors of individuals in our family, individuals in our teaching environment, individuals close to us also tend to play a very important role. And last but the most important is the culture that we are born into and that we then eventually grow in. So the culture tends to shape how we think, believe, behave, what values we hold, etc. Thank you.